F1 Digital Plus, a product so ahead of its time it was always destined to fail. We've all heard of F1 TV Pro, right? A subscription-based F1 broadcasting service featuring presenting from the likes of Will Buxton, Lawrence Barreto and Rosanna Tennant, and commentary from the likes of Alex Jakes and Jolian Palmer. It offers unprecedented levels of F1 coverage to fans, with 24 live simultaneous feeds available to the audience, as well as exclusive onboards of every driver. It's broadcast throughout the year on Grand Prix weekends, showcasing all sessions and offering analysis and bespoke programming, all for $79 a year if you're in the US. Or sadly, if you're in the UK, you can only subscribe to the basic F1 TV package, because Sky holds the exclusive broadcasting rights. But what if I told you there was a forerunner to this, a broadcasting service that was so ahead of its time that it was always destined to fail? This is the story of F1 Digital Plus. The year is 1996, Britpop is a phenomenon with Oasis and Blur battling it out in the UK charts, Nintendo has just released the N64, and only 36 million people were online, just 0.9% of the world's population. F1 was enjoying the halcyon days of its tobacco sponsorship, title fights between Michael Schumacher and Damon Hill, as well as the rise of a new star from Canada called Jack Villeneuve. However, the EU was clamping down on tobacco advertising, with more restrictions coming into play on a yearly basis, Bernie Eccleston believed that there was revenue to be had in digital TV, particularly with a pay-per-view format. In terms of TV coverage, at the time broadcasters would receive a set of world feed pictures for them to add their own commentary over, such as Murray Walker and Jonathan Palmer in the UK on the BBC. Each race was produced by a local host broadcaster, such as Tele Monte Carlo for Monaco and Fuji Television for Japan, which would often lead to inconsistent broadcast quality from race to race, or them focusing on a local driver cruising around outside the points, rather than a battle for the podium. And that's where F1 Digital aimed to bridge the gap in terms of quality. An investment of $35 million was made initially, and such was the technology available at the time, it was offered on satellite TV platforms, and was a subscription-based service with viewers paying on a per-race basis. Beginning at the 1996 German Grand Prix, the service was initially available on the German-based DF1 channel, broadcasting to Germany, Austria and Switzerland. Coverage of each Grand Prix would be produced on site with over 200 tonnes of equipment and 200 staff being flown to the races in order to produce the six-channel coverage. They would also have broadcast units at the back of the team's garages for exclusive interviews with teams and drivers, and access to every single garage thanks to their connections with Bernie. Later on, France's Canal Plus, Italy's Teleplus, Spain's Canal Satellite Digital and the UK's Big Sky B would join in the party, the latter of which launched a bespoke channel ahead of the 2002 season, featuring an in-studio presenting team of Matt Lorenzo, who'd previously voiced F1 season reviews in the early to mid-90s, with pundits such as Perry McCarthy and Damon Hill. By the time of its launch, the six-channel offering had increased to eight to incorporate the new studio elements, which were unique to the UK. Welcome to F1 Digital Plus. Live, uninterrupted, interactive Formula One. Master was a studio channel showing footage from the Super Signal, and it would cut away to show InVision interviews and live studio analysis during the race. Super Signal, which was also abbreviated to Super, was the main digital world feed produced by the FOM for all of Europe. Track A was similar to the Super Signal, but focused on the leaders of the race. Track B was again similar to the Super Signal, but focused on the action further down the running order. Data showed live timing and data screens. Onboard consisted entirely of materials from the car's onboard cameras with no commentary. Pit lane was also commentary free with footage from the cameras in the pit lane and highlights were rolling highlights up to that current point in the race. F1 Digital worked alongside local host broadcasters at some races, whilst at others they solely produced the television coverage of the event, again providing a world feed set of pictures to international free-to-air broadcasters such as ITV. In April 2002, Kirch Media, who held the rights to F1 and produced the coverage, collapsed with debts of $5.7 billion, bringing a huge air of uncertainty to the future of F1 Digital Plus. Despite significant investment from FOM during its tenure, there was no getting away from the fact that the service made continual losses year after year owing to poor viewing figures. To give you an example, subscribers in the UK were being charged up to £12 per race, with the channel broadcasting to an audience of sometimes less than 10,000. Things worsened when compared to to a figure of around 3 to 4 million for free to air coverage on the UK's ITV channel at the time. Drop the punch and let's go! Motor is away well, but Coulthard is away better. He's around the outside. Coulthard leads. It's a Sandy Bob. Fantastic start. 
it was clear that action needed to be taken to try and bolster the ratings. The final six races were offered at a discounted amount of £50 compared to the usual price of £72. However, it did little to swell the tide and encourage viewers to make the switch. And at the end of 2002, the plug was pulled with F1 Digital ceasing to broadcast worldwide, causing the loss of over 200 jobs in the process. With over $100 million spent at the time of its closure, F1 Digital Plus was regarded as a huge commercial flop and a massive own goal for F1. But why did it fail? It can be reduced down to just one reason. F1 Digital Plus was the right product, but just 20 years too early. With coverage being free to wear in the majority of the world at the time, F1 Digital Plus only ever appealed to a more dedicated and hardcore follower, but not the casual fan. The world was also a very different place in the late 90s and early noughties, with the internet still growing, social media being something that only The Simpsons could think of, and Netflix trying to compete in the home DVD world, with the vast majority of people just did not want to pay extra for something that had little benefit. F1 Digital Plus pioneered so many things that we take for granted in a modern F1 broadcast, such as multiple onboard cameras with overlay graphics, team radio, and even a lap counter at the top of the screen. From the mid-2000s, the FOM began taking control of the world feed and creating coverage themselves on site rather than leaving the job to local host broadcasters. As of 2021, only the Monaco Grand Prix was produced locally by TMC. And we all know how well. What has happened? We need to know who's going to come out in front as we see Lance Stroll hitting the barrier and going over the curb one more time. In 2012, live coverage in the UK was taken over by Sky, who created their own bespoke channel to produce and broadcast F1. Sounds familiar, right? Consumer habits have changed dramatically since, with the rise in popularity of social media and digital marketing on YouTube proving to be extremely beneficial for Formula One. Liberty Media's involvement after their takeover in 2016 cannot be underestimated either. They've managed to market the sport to a more casual audience in a more effective way than ever before, investing heavily in digital marketing with YouTube and other social media platforms, and also being instrumental in the critically acclaimed Drive to Survive series on Netflix. All of these factors have created more of an appetite for a pay-per-view service, and that of course is where F1 TV comes in. Rising from the ashes of F1 Digital Plus's failure, it launched in 2019, but this time as an online service, offering, thanks to advancements in technology, even more to its audience than the predecessor was able to. Ultimately, I think it's a huge shame that F1 Digital Plus isn't remembered quite as fondly as I believe it should be, and I hope this video has been a nostalgic trip down memory lane. On behalf of Damon, Jeremy, Ben and Watty in the commentary box, Peter Windsor in the pit lane and a considerable number behind the scenes, I'd like to thank you for being part of a Formula One revolution. Whatever happens in the years to come, what you've seen on Formula One Digital Plus will have paved the way. Do you have any memories of F1 Digital Plus? Feel free to comment below. I really hope you've enjoyed this video. A huge thank you to everybody who's been able to help out, including Nick Damon, who was a part of the F1 Digital Plus team back in the day as well. Please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe if you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.